Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here for several reasons. The first reason is that you're so young, so it brings me back uh, 20, 25 years ago when I was in Palo Alto writing the code for Alta Vista. So it's good. I'm not writing code any, you know, anymore except for some iOS apps for handling music. So I'm, I'm really happy to be, to be here. Second reason is that there's a company here in the bronze sponsor, so I'm going to cite them, called Algolia. They're, they're from Xelite. So this is good. The third reason is that x is also entering the, AP, the API uh, game with uh, a way to access our web crawl, because as you mentioned, uh, we, we used to be uh, the, the, lead, the French, uh, the European leader for enterprise search uh, before we were acquired by the SO system. And now, uh, but we still have a web crawl and, uh, and a web search engine. X8.com, and so now we're using this as a data source to sort of uh, make a distillery for data and uh, and provide structured data to our customers to um, to do some very interesting stuff. So I know there are a couple of X8 guys here. I see one there. Uh, there are others. If you're interested, you can talk to them about this. So the, the other reason I'm interested, so that's already three reasons. So that's four reasons I'm interested to be here. Is that I think since you're very young here, you consider yourself to be the future of the world. And in a sense, you are. I mean, technically speaking, I think you are. Now, what's really interesting is that, um, so I was in Palo Alto in, in the early uh, 90s, and I, I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation at the time. And um, I was lucky enough to see the web, and the first web browsers, when there was, there was just 100 websites in the world. It was uh, the wow effect, you know, it was really cool. And so I've seen all this industry evolve from the inside from all these years. And so what we're wit witnessing today with big data is a third phase of this digital revolution that is going to be culturally and from an industrial standpoint very different from what we've seen in the first two. The first revolution was really about corporate IT. So it's you know where uh, probably Microsoft, SAP, Oracle come from. Uh, and it was about uh, digitalizing uh, processes in many industries. Uh, the second revolution, that's probably the one you're referring to in terms of culture, is uh, the B2C revolution, the internet revolution. Uh, there were the first bubble that burst uh, in, uh, in 2000, and now the second wave, if you will, from 2000, uh, where you saw the uh, development of Google, of Facebook, of, uh, the, uh, of the mobile uh, ecosystem, um, and e-commerce extra. And probably the startup culture where you all live today comes from the second revolution. What we are witnessing today is a shift in the way the startup ecosystem is going to, uh, is going to be structured, in particular, I think, in terms of exit, in terms also of activities, and is going to be to have a profound impact of many industries. So I think it's so smart from the organizers, I have nothing to do with this, to have industrial sponsors from this event, because what's really happening now is that we're facing um, an industrial revolution, and the term is not, is not fake, it's a real revolution that's going to have deep impacts on all sorts of industries, actually all industries, that's, that's my take and where you're going to have a really important part to play. But what I want to stress is that be warned that the culture in which uh, you grew up, uh, because most of you are young, the, uh, sorry for the others, no offense, but I'm, I'm targeting the younger audience here, all the others, you know, they, you, know I, you know what I'm talking about, but all the others probably don't. Uh, you have to choose your camp whether you're going to have uh, the benefits of what you're saying, you're doing, or just be the uh, uh, the um, how do you call that the the, the blue collars uh, from this uh, new type of uh, industry revolution. So I'm going to deep into the de dive into the details so that you can understand what I'm saying, which is very abstract. I I understand. So. Um, so as you mentioned, so I've been I've been uh, I've been uh, I've been writing code. I've, I've done a PhD. I have been an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been a teacher too, uh, for many years. And after two years, uh, I've also been involved with two government uh, government initiatives. One, uh, working on long-term uh, vision for innovation in France uh, and identifying uh, priorities for the country 
where we have to be present. And one of these seven priorities is big data. And the second initiative is uh, being the co-chair of the French uh, government initiative on big data with uh, the CEO of Capgemini. And so doing this, I've, I've, I've come to uh, discuss with many uh, industries I was not familiar with. So I was familiar with, with telcos, extra. I was not familiar with utilities, with insurance companies, with banks, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of industries. And I've discovered that big data is really going to have a deep impact on them. But you really have to understand what big data is. So there's, there, there, there are two ways to, to think of big data. The first one is I have the data in my data uh, warehouses, my databases, and I have to make them speak, so to speak. Okay, I have to make some analytics, some business intelligence, something to make sense of this data and make my processes, my business better. Typically, my, my customer relationship better because that's where this revolution is all about. But that's, that's, that's what IDC, Gartner, Forrester, all the analyst firms uh, are talking about, okay? Take the data you have, make it useful, and use it to improve your business. <coughs> but that's, that's the, the, the tiny part of the equation. The big part of the equation is really about inventing new ways to connect to, to customers, inventing new businesses, inventing new usage which people are going to love and are going to adopt and are going to become addictive addicted to them so this entire industry uh, revolution industrial revolution is about inventing new type of usage that people love adopt and become addicted to so addiction is the key word here um, and this industry is very different is going to be organized very differently from what it is today Today you have industries, you know, aerospace, automotive, uh, finance, you know, all sorts of vertical industries. And these industries, they have their own customers with their own types of usage. And they interact with one another in a sort of B2B setting. This new uh, type of organization of industries will lead and has already led to the emergence of um, natural monopolies. So what is its what is a natural monopoly? Well, it's a monopoly that sort of self-sustains itself. So let's have a look of, uh, at what happened in the, in, the, in the second phase of this digital revolution, the B2C revolution. You've seen the emergence of companies like Google. What is the, the, the natural monopoly of Google? Well, it's the business model of the free internet. It's advertising. And why is it a monopoly? You may say there are other uh, advertising uh, 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 companies, uh, Yahoo, Microsoft. Well, it's a monopoly because if you think about it, if you have the largest traffic on your uh, internet search engine, well, advertisers cannot avoid to come and make advertisements on your website. So they're going to bid on the keywords. And the more they bid on the keywords, the highest the price uh, goes. Okay, that's the first effect. The second effect is that if the prices go high, only the industries that actually own the keyword, like the keyword insurance, for instance, are going to be able to buy the keyword. Because otherwise, for poker games, online poker games, it's going to be too expensive to buy the keyword insurance, for instance. So this will lead to very well-targeted keywords and very good targeted advertising on the search uh, on the result page. And so people will tend to click on them because they are better targeted at the real thing. So you will have a click-through rate which is higher. Also, if you have more advertisers, you have, uh, you have actually a coverage of the queries that have advertising displayed which is higher. So once again, you're going to monetize your search engine better and so on and so on. There are at least a couple of other things that make your presence on the web uh, even more, even stronger if you're already strong. So this makes for natural monopolies. Um, what is the natural monopoly of Apple? Well, this is more interesting because it's, it's more difficult to define. I will call it simplicity and comfort with a bit of luxury, okay? When you're in the Apple ecosystem, it's comfortable, it's comfy, it works. Well, except I spent my weekend trying to recover from an Apple bug. I changed my Apple ID and suddenly the world 
went to hell, but that's another story. So it's comfortable as long as you don't try to be too smart. Um, what is the natural monopoly of Amazon, for instance? Well, it's, it's basically the ability to deliver goods, physical goods, instantly. You want it, you have it, with prime subscription extra. What is the digital monopoly, the natural monopoly of Facebook, for instance? Well, it's social interaction, instant gratification with social interaction, and so on. And the reason why these guys have a, a monopoly, it's not technically speaking a monopoly. Google Plus is an alternative to Facebook, for instance. But why are you going to go to Google Plus if all your friends are already on Facebook? It's really hard. So in a, in a monopoly world, there's only place for natural leaders. And it's very hard to go on the territory of the others. See Google Plus, it's a failure. Uh, if you look at the ad business of Microsoft, the monetization is really not that good compared to, uh, compared to Google's. Um, when we launched exit.com, of course, we didn't have an ad, um, uh, our own um, advertisement system, so we had to pick one. So we picked Yahoo. We don't want to pick Google, of course, because it was the biggest competitor. But the money we got from the deal was so low that eventually we had to pick Google. And then when we picked Google, we had some very bizarre clauses in the contract that said every time you want to change the user interface, you have to uh, show them to us. So we were obliged to show our interface to the guy we were competing with, which is absurd. So we are entering a new phase of the digital revolution where natural monopolies are, become, are becoming the rule. This has very uh, interesting consequences for startups, for instance. Well, first, either you're a supplier for these guys, and being a supplier in, in the business in general is not a very good position to be in, because you're not going to take the margin. The margin goes to the people that own the customer. And this revolution is driven by adoption by end users of new types of usages. So you really have to be careful or where you're going to be and who you're going to sell to, who are going to be your customers. Are they end customers? Are they businesses? The first thing. The second thing is that you really need to understand that there are only that many slots in a human brain for addictive usages. So it's really hard to invent a new one. Well, Facebook did that. Uh, Google did that. These guys did that. But now they're having a hard time inventing their second monopoly. Well, maybe Google with, um, Google is a very interesting company. We'll come, that, come back to this because they're very, uh, they're very involved into industry right now. And uh, so is Elon Musk. And we'll come back to that later. But so these guys are trying to invent new usages and, and create new monopolies. What is really, really different from the second revolution is the way these guys are financed. The startup world that you all know were financed by angels and then VCs, round A, round B, round C, and eventually there were exits like IPOs or um, a buyout by a big firm. The IPO route is becoming really harder and harder. The reason for this is that there's big monopolies that are being constituted. And it's really hard to become a new natural monopoly that actually has the ability to go uh, to the market and make an IPO. So more and more of the route for startups are going to be acquired by these uh, digital monopolies. And now there's an, and that's the second part of the talk, now there's going to be a really uh, interesting war between these new monopolies and the old world, the old world being, sorry for them, but orange, um, uh, you know, all the industries you know and love or hate, depending on how is your customer relationship with them. Normally you hate them. Okay, it's half my time, good. So, um, so this war is about uh, trying to capture the customer. That's a very old story, right? Trying to capture the customers. But the thing is, people are not, these guys are thinking very different. In the new world, the customer relationship is owned by the product. You have to have a very good product, a one that people are addicted to. And normally, if your product is really good, you don't have to have customer support, customer service. 
So just one example, sorry for the, sorry for the guys I'm going to mention, but it's, it's between you and me, okay? It's not film, right? But so I've, uh, for my new company, I went to Office uh, 365 because I wanted, I wanted to synchronize my email with my iPhone and the only way to do that is to have an exchange account. Don't ask me why, that's the way it is. So I went there. And then at some point in time, I tried to, um, uh, to enable two-factor authentication. And that's where my second nightmare began. The first one was with Apple this weekend. This one was before. And um, so I called, I called the customer service and I said, okay, I want to uh, enable uh, two-factor authentication. I said, sure, uh, what is it? Okay, so I had to read them web pages and all of that. Oh, interesting. Okay, so um, no, that's not possible. Well, I can read on the web, it's possible. No, that's not possible. Okay, so I hang up, I do my, you know, my stuff, I read. So indeed, I didn't have the good business plan. I was a petite entreprise uh, premium, and now it was business premium, something like this. So I call back, I point them to the right URL saying, well, see, it's written here. I say, oh, okay. Well, to make a very long story short, I had to go through the head of Microsoft France to get my problem solved, involving engineers in California, and blah, 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 blah. It was a nightmare, complete nightmare. I spent hours and hours with customer service. I had the same experience with these guys here, but sh the sponsors, so I cannot tell you. So this is to tell you what is the difference between a B2C product, Office 360, made by a B2B company trying to reinvent itself as a B2C company and a native B2C uh, product made by the B2C company. So this is the challenge that the, the old industries are facing, trying to reinvent themselves in a setting where their products are, one, addictive, two, serve a new type of usage that is not already served by somebody else because there's no room in the natural monopoly world for being second you're either number one or you're a subcontractor. You cannot be number two. Well, with some exceptions, like for instance, if you're Microsoft, you have tons of cash, and so of course you can sort of lose tons of money to have your own ad system because it's a strategic for you, and so you do so, right? But if you're not, well, you cannot. And these guys don't have tons of piles of cash. The other thing which is really interesting to, uh, important to understand in this new revolution is the way, I mentioned that already, that the way people are financed. If you look, for instance, at Uber, for instance, the, you all know that the latest round of uh, funding was about $1 billion, a valuation of 16 billion, 17 billion or something like this. This is huge. You have to understand that the leaders of this new economy are not financed by, uh, uh, by uh, the market. It's not, it's not public companies. They're not financed by banks either. They are not financed by VCs, properly speaking. They're financed by so-called private equity, which is physical people, billionaires, either in the Valley or in Russia or in China, that are making a highly um, hypothetical bet on the long-term uh, appearance of new times of uh, recurring revenues. So. All the industries, like utilities, for instance, that are selling recurring revenues, telcos, uh, energy, uh, you name it, these guys are the next target of these guys. And these guys here are financed by the market. There are analysts that you know, look quarter after quarter the results. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, buyers and sellers uh, for their stock. Uh, then there's the banks, extra. It's really hard for these guys to have a very long-term view on their business when they're facing natural monopolies financed by physical persons that are really ready to make a bet on the long term. Let me take one example. Elon Musk is, is the person to watch to understand what's happening. Uh, you, you know that's the founder of PayPal, okay? Now, he's really interesting into brick and mortar know, physical industry. So Tesla is the first example. Tesla is interesting because it's really a connected car, electric vehicle, and it could very well have chosen to go to see General Motors or Ford or whoever and said, okay, build me a car, I'm going to put my batteries in there, 
put an iPad uh, under the hood and, um, and I'm done. But he didn't do that. Rather, rather he chose to uh, actually build his own car, which is kind of peculiar. So basically, instead of trying to put an iPad in a car, he, tr he preferred to put wheels around an iPad okay, and make his own car. Why did he do that? Because you have to understand that with the kind of financing that these industries have and, and the kind of natural monopoly that are targeting, they need to be what is called full-stack startup. What is a full-stack startup? It's nothing more that, than an industry that is defined by the final usage of the product that's selling and has the entire chain integrated from the production of what they're selling, well, in this case, cars, to the distribution channel and everything in between. To understand that, you have to understand that Elon Musk is now fighting the US government for laws that are forbidding people like him to sell cars direct to customers. In the US, you have laws that force you, if you're a car manufacturer, to sell your cars through dealership. Okay? And this is very bad for him because he wants to have a direct digital relationship with, with his customers. Second thing, this guy now, he's building spacecrafts, or rockets, rather. For now, it's rockets. <laughs> Who knows? Okay? And so you might say, well, it's unfair because really he's using technology that has been subsidized by the uh, UX taxpayers for 30 years. He's using Na uh, NASA engineers and, and, uh, and the Department of Defense in the US to do that. Well, very well. But in the end, the price of sending one kilogram of stuff of a satellite in space is now $10,000 per kilogram. And the price of the same thing, the same kilogram, for Ariane 5 is twice that, $20,000 per kilo. And the direct consequence is that Ariane 6, the new launcher, the European launcher, has been thrown to the trash and redrawn from scratch to target this price. So they, they went from a high-end launcher to a low-cost launcher. So, the, and, and this is not it. There's been leaks that now this guy, Elon Musk, is going to launch 700 satellites, not uh, different kinds of satellites, local satellites to provide internet access to third world or emerging countries. So you have to understand that it's a new form of what I call hyper-capitalism. It's huge amount of money behind very few entrepreneurs and we're living a moment in history of industry where it's a bifurcation moment in history. It's going to have deep impacts on every industry business model. Uh, if you take the insurance industry, for instance, when you look at it, there's a global trend in the world that middle, uh, middle class uh, populations are becoming poorer. You all know the richer are become richer, the rich are become richer, the poor are become poorer, and in the middle, well, there's less people with less money. And so they have a tendency to actually use stuff rather than buy stuff. They prefer to pay a recurring thing rather than invest. And if you don't buy and invest, then you don't insure your stuff. So for insurers, it's, insurers, it's a problem. If you use public transportation and do not buy a car, why do you not insure your car? And then there's the Y generation, you guys, I mean, a part of you, a part of you guys, that have a tendency to prefer the sharing economy, prefer to use, not to own extra. That makes this trend even stronger. So the bottom line of the business is shrinking. And what this tells you is that we're going from an industry where you are building stuff and selling stuff to an economy where you're buying, you building stuff, making that stuff work yourself, and selling a service to customers with a recurring revenue. This is a major evolution. This is where you guys have a part to play. But you really need to have to understand that the way the traditional industries are going to interact with one another is going to be profoundly impacted what I've just described. Because instead of having industries, pure industries, specialized in, you know, in their own uh, segment, we're going to have full-stack startups, 
natural monopolies integrated from A to Z, doing their own stuff, and interacting with the rest of the world with B2B agreements. And of course, the margin when you have a B2B agreement is going to be very different from the margin you get when you sell the service yourself to the end customers. Do I have some more time? Five minutes. Okay, so I was told there's no questions, so questions. Raise your hand. The first one is always the hardest. You have to turn it on. I can't hear you. It's okay. But I work. My ear works. It's okay. It's it's not it, it's not um, a revolution that is driven by what people want. It's a monopoly that is. It's a revolution that's driven by what companies are offering to the people. They are trying to offering addictive services. So, Chief Jobs famously said one day, "People don't know what they want until you show it to them." This is precisely what this is all about. So, to if you want to become a monopoly in this new world, you have to invent a new usage. Let me give you two examples that are really interesting. Well, actually, or one, even one example. The music industry. <coughs> it's, it's a very common situation where when you're the leader in an industry, it's unthinkable that somebody else that is from outside of your industry is going to invent the future of your own industry because you are the industry. How can somebody else invent the future of your own industry? Well, take the example of music, for instance. What happened with the uh, iPod? Well, Steve Jobs you know, loved music, as you all know. But you also all know that at the time, you had CDs, and you had uh, you know, uh, places to uh, put your CDs. And since it's really hard to find a CD that is you know, this way, because you have to turn your head, you only, uh, maybe the younger, forget what I'm saying, you didn't know this time, but the older guys here. Um, uh, so you, 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 you had a tendency to listen only uh, 10 CDs that were put on top of the stack. And not this way, but that way. That's how it worked, okay? Only, you only listen to the same music all the time. I used to do that. And I love music all the time. Uh, I listen to music all the time, but always listen to the same music all the time. I eventually got bored. And so um, what Steve Jobs proposed is, is a new type of usage where you could listen all your music. Remember the first iPod? It was a thousand songs. Oh, huge. A thousand songs um, on, on your mobile device. So actually, it was two innovations. The first one, you would not only listen to the first 10 CDs, but all your CDs. That's the first innovation. The second innovation was you, could, you were able to listen that even if you were not at home. Second innovation. So that's a new usage that the people in the, uh, in the music industry hadn't anticipated. And why would have they done that? They had distribution channels. They have you know, all sorts of uh, processes in place to uh, print CDs, uh, DVDs or CDs, you know, distribute them. Why would they disrupt their own industry? So Steve Jobs went to see these guys and said, well, the way your sales cycles work is that you're selling uh, there's a new artist with a new album is going to sell for like a couple of months and then phew, nothing. You know, you sell one CD every now and then. So basically your inventory is worthless. Once the initial sales are done, your inventory is useless. So let me license your inventory for a small price and uh, I do something with it. Of course, I'm sure he didn't tell them what he was going to do with it. And that's how he became the natural monopoly for some time, I, I will elaborate on that later, but it became the natural monopoly of music, uh, digital music. 
Now, what's really interesting is that he then became the leader of this industry. And once again, I think he could not imagine that somebody was going to do to him what he did to the uh, majors. And these guys were Deezer and Spotify. Streaming. What is innovation? Well, not only do you listen to uh, the music you bought, all the music you bought away from home, but now you listen to any kind of music, even if you don't buy it, because you pay a, a subscription price. This is a major innovation. And so eventually in Europe, iTunes revenue fell 13%, one three percent this year. And they bought a streaming uh, service to try to fight this. So this kind of state of denial in which leaders of every industry are in general does not also applies to the digital, uh, uh, digital monopolies. And so these guys are also going to be disrupted now by a new kind of innovation, music recommendation. Because it's good to be able to listen to all sorts of music all the time, anywhere, but you still have to choose it. It's a pain. So now the next frontier is to try to push music to you as opposed to you pulling the music out uh, of the system. And what's really, really interesting is that also exemplifies another key element of this revolution. The models that rely on locking in people does not work unless there's also some benefit from them, for them being locked. Pleasure, addiction. And this applies to people in the telco industry. For years, they've been selling uh, subscriptions with lock-ins, like 12 months or 24 months, where you couldn't go out. They were subsidizing uh, your iPhone, for instance, or your Android uh, handset for this. They understood that being nice to new customers was not as effective as being nice to current customers. And having happy customers was less costly and more effective, retaining customers were more effective than providing, preventing them from leaving. This is one, uh, one key element of maintaining a monopoly. That's a very interesting question. We need uh, half an hour to discuss this, but, yeah, just, just, you know. but no, it's a car manufacturer that told you that. Yeah. That's because this guy is still in the old world. In the new world, it's not even certain that car manufacturers will manufacture cars and even give them to customers. Maybe Tesla will do that for Google, Uber, and actually will buy a, you will buy a service. You will not own a car, even if it's free. So actually, that's a very good example. I wanted to talk about this. I forgot, but the uh, so the, the, the mobility is a very interesting uh, sector. Uh, urban mobility, in particular, because that's where most of the uh, Earth population currently lives, and that's where all the uh, uh, all the uh, impact is going to be. Um, if you think about it, well, let's imagine a scenario where, say, Google. Um, partners with Tesla to build not cars, electric cars for CEOs, but uh, Autolib, like uh, for the French uh, speaking audience here, Autolib, uh, uh, Autolib like uh, small cars, but uh, driverless, okay? That can drive themselves uh, like your uh, vacuum cleaner does, right? And, um, and then, uh, and then goes to, uh, to uh, uh, recharge um, at the periphery of Paris, for instance, okay? And then you add a twist. The twist is that you replace the, the back, uh, how you call that, uh, the back of the car, uh, the, uh, the back of the car, by five things. And with your NFC, right, you, you put this, your phone, and suddenly one of the five things opens, and then you take your uh, package from Amazon, for instance. So you replace, uh, you replace uh, a situation where you're locked one day at home waiting for the delivery guy to deliver, to, to deliver something, which is a pain in the neck because of course either you're under the shower or you don't listen to the phone or uh, some other guy doesn't have the phone or the code is wrong or there's always a good reason for the guy not to deliver the package, right? So it's, it's a pain, so it's a, it, 
it's a real pain. So you replace this model by a new model. And the new model not only delivers uh, people like you and me, but also physical goods. You're going to disrupt not only car manufacturers, you're going to disrupt uh, insurance companies, you're going to disrupt UPS, uh, US, um, US uh, Postal Services, uh, La Poste, Colissimo, DHL, uh, who else? I mean, so many people are going to be disrupted. So this is the, the right model. The other one, no, don't think so. Uh, 